Super Mario 64, the groundbreaking 3D platformer that changed the gaming world forever. As a lifelong fan of this game, oh, we're not really talking about you yet, so maybe just wait. I can't help but notice this ever evolving trend that seems to continuously reach new heights every time I go to revisit it. And that's what leads us to today's burning question, one that we're gonna get down to the bottom of together. Why of all games has Mario 64 been the one to gain such a notorious reputation as a horror? Or better yet, how did this all happen? This was a game that I personally would spend countless hours in, simply, well, I mean, doing nothing, really. The levels were incredibly large. The world felt infinite, almost like a dream. And the mysteries, they seemed so abundant. You could spend days, months, or even years trying to solve some of these. But this wave of content finally led me to start questioning my own memories. Had I mistaken this limitless feeling for emptiness? After disregarding the creepy pasta style videos on YouTube and trying to not cave into any of this fan content for the better part of, I don't know, like three years now, I finally fell victim to the wormhole and returned to Super Mario 64 with a new perspective? This time around, being influenced to pick up on the alleged sense of dread, despair, and loneliness that players felt like haunted this world. Has it always felt this way? Or has the resurgence of this game's eerie aspects started to skew our view of the game? Well, to figure this one out, I think we're gonna have to go back to where it all began. But before we do that, I'm gonna have to ask you to go ahead and whack that subscribe button. And now that you've done that, let's dive in. The 1970s to the late 90s were a time of limitless creativity and innovation in the gaming industry. A time where every development team shared the common goal of attempting to create something so masterful that it would shape the future of gaming itself. Throughout these decades specifically is where we can selectively pick out the genre-defining games that would go on to shape the following generation of games to come. You know, like Pong, Doom, Street Fighter? Uh. Tetris? We can often trace back certain aspects such as, you know, movement or mechanics or gunplay back to earlier titles. But for Mario 64, that isn't really the case. This game had broken the mold of what was thought to be possible and stands alone as a true original and defining experience. First conceived in the early 90s, while Shigeru Miyamoto was developing Star Fox for the SNES, knowing that this concept deserved more than what the SNES could offer at that time, Shigeru and the team ultimately made the decision to hold off on production and instead would craft this game alongside the revolutionary tech that the N64 would bring to life. Not for the console's enhanced capabilities, but rather for the brand new controller featuring multiple buttons and a buttery smooth analog stick. And it came at a time when most platformers were limited by a stiff, clunky D-pad. Nintendo had taken the opportunity to bring a new level of precision and fluidity to gaming, elevating the player's ability to make those split-second decisions with ease. A decision that set the stage for a unique blend like no other. Much like how Wii Sports fits effortlessly with the Wii's motion controls, this game and its respective console being built together led to a certain level of hive mind hard Germany, that even today's games still strive to achieve. And I mean, don't get me wrong here, Nintendo had been the leader of gaming innovation for quite some time, but it was really this game that sent users into awe. Well, it wasn't the first 3D platformer to ever exist, Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time alike were truly two of the first 2D games to be successfully brought to 3D while still holding on to their iconic feel and gameplay style. While Nintendo has many philosophies they stick to when creating their flagship games, Mario 64 was actually one that required Nintendo to go against one of their own, as instead of making the game with the sole intention of a player rushing to complete it, Mario 64 was built on the hope of players truly taking their time to explore and enjoy everything the game had to offer. And building it like this, Nintendo had to have known that this would inspire players to go that extra mile to uncover hidden secrets that might otherwise go unnoticed. And perhaps that's why in modern times, 27 years after its initial release, it seems to appear from the ashes and run rampant on the internet within a different subgenre every few years. Probably one of the most popular and well-known would be its unique and almost beautiful relationship with the speedrunning community. But this time, more specifically in the past few years, the world of Mario 64 had taken an unexpected turn online, to say the least. With many players now claiming that they had always felt something unsettling about the game. But is there really? Is there really something ominous about the game's intentions? From what I could gather, this all seemed to begin in early 2020. But don't 
Don't get me wrong, for years fans have created this sort of creepypasta-esque content surrounding the game, but I chose to start our story here, in early 2020, because it was really then that this trend resurged, rocketing to a height that I don't think anyone could have predicted. A few conversations between a small group of people seemed to have really struck a chord with a surprisingly wide audience, and those conversations had been in regard to nightmares inspired by Mario 64. But strangely enough, these users found that a lot of the reported nightmares can contain much of the same material. This phenomenon evolved further when these conversations made their way off the platform, with visual depictions of these alleged nightmares beginning to pop up on YouTube, with millions of users flocking to them. The best rendition of these found footage-esque clips has to come from Greenio's Super Mario 64 Classified series, where these clips would appear with nothing more than a date in the title. This washed out footage that looks like as if someone had recorded their TV while playing the game allowed users to see Mario in a different light. Stepping away from the traditional vivid and imaginative landscapes that I recall exploring, we were now seeing posts like these appearing more often, and this was one of the main contributing factors that gave life to the upcoming trend that would see Mario 64 reborn as a horror game. And with the outbreak of this rumor now circulating, we'd start seeing images, theories, fan games, and even ARGs popping up around every corner, with all of these stemming back to the now infamous Super Mario 64 iceberg. All of these mysterious theories gathered together in one place at one time just waiting to be dissected and brought to life. Of course, this iceberg had been popularized by creators such as Mish Cause and NESC Retro, with their palatable renditions of the iceberg. The timely resurgence for this game really starts to make sense when we take a step back and view this time period as a whole. 2020 was at its core a year of uncertainty, and given the circumstances, this led a lot of people to seek escapism in the form of whatever entertainment was available at that moment. This is something to consider when we see the amplified reaction that followed two massive events for Nintendo fans in that same year. One of these events, of course, being the Nintendo Switch port of Mario 64. A lot of kids who didn't experience the game at the time of its initial release had now been exposed to everything it had to offer when it hit the console, which meant this new generation of players had taken their first steps into the castle, only to be met with ghostly inhabitants, frozen worlds trapped behind paintings, and an almost cruel sense of loneliness. With its initial release, the experience the game provided was not not only groundbreaking, but visually impressive too. As time progressed and the limitations of what the N64 could offer graphically, you know, really began to show, this time around, the eerie atmosphere of an early 3D world left a lasting impression on a rather vocal audience. An audience that had grown up with the likes of FNAF, not to mention the surge of other loosely related indie horror games with enough lore to drive you clinically insane. Therefore, it shouldn't really come as a surprise that this audience brought along a pile of new ideas and horror-like content that had gone on to alter the internet's perception of the game. But just adding more fuel on top of this fire was the groundbreaking Nintendo Gigaly that had users flocking to a 4chan board where files could be found broken into two chunks, one for SNES and another for N64 games, each of these being filled with source code and development repositories for well over a dozen classic Nintendo games, ranging from games like of course Mario 64, but also Ocarina of Time, Mario Kart, A Link to the Past? They even violated my guy Dr. Mario! And this meant an entire fan base was now running rabid to dissect and comb through every single line of code, asset, and secret hidden in these games. This was something that led a lot of users to begin posting and showing restricted gameplay from Mario 64, among other games of course. All of this coming at a point when most players who enjoyed the base game growing up were now adults. And those adults were yearning for something a little more complex than what the original game maybe had to offer. And that was exactly exactly what they had been granted whether they liked it or not. Between an iceberg absolutely loaded with theories, social feeds filled with never before seen content, and an entirely new generation taking their first steps into the game, Mario 64's slow descent into the horror genre was really the culmination of several aspects meeting at the right place at the right time. This game, 27 years ago, brought with it a legacy of mysteries and rumors, traveling by word of mouth between players on the playground. The unknowns of video games largely remain secrets, partly due to the resources that we have today not being available, but also being solely available on cartridges left them more susceptible to corruption and damage. And with each player having their own personal cartridge to look after, it's exactly that aspect that had given rise to the unverifiable schoolyard rumor that inspired modern day Super Mario 64 creepypastas to tap into the sense of the unknown or better yet, the unproven. The most prominent of these is what can be found at the lowest level of the Mario 
64 iceberg. An all-encompassing fan theory that gives explanation and reasoning for the entirety of the modern mystery. A theory that believes the Mario 64 you remember is not the same game that your friends remember, nor is it the same game that anyone else online remembers. As with each user the game came into contact with, a personalized copy was born. Allegedly due to Nintendo's usage of an experimental personalization artificial intelligence system that would alter the in-game world, the more it became accustomed to your personal playstyle. Each decision, each micro interaction, each area explored, each area left unexplored, every choice that you made was being watched and carefully calculated. As a community, there was enough common ground within each copy of the game for these changes to lie dormant, ultimately going undetected by the player. But this would create a phenomenon that would give reason to the unnerving and almost disassociated feeling that would come from playing a friend's copy of the game, and the several almost Mandela effect-like anomalies being reported by users. For example, the Golden Mario. This creature is said to take the form of Mario with a gold-like texture applied, and manifests as a boss fight against the player. But that's where things get strange. While some recall a boss fight, others swear by a playable variant of Golden Mario, alleging that some personalized copies feature the gold cap, essentially making the player invincible and dealing enough damage to enemies to defeat them upon contact. Another one of these common anomalies that feeds into this theory is the Birthday Toad, a harmless and adorable little NPC that would hang out around Peach's castle, commonly replacing Toad within any floor. But upon speaking to the Toad, instead of greeting you or letting out one of their specific NPC lines, this Toad will say 999 days left, with no further explanation. The countdown has been a mysterious puzzle for players, with reports of it lasting a week for some, while others have waited a year or longer in eager anticipation. But when the time finally arrives, players have reported what feels like a surreal experience as they are transported to a dark room upon selecting their save file from the main menu. And it's inside this room that the birthday toad awaits, requesting for you to please light the cake. And if you choose to do so by turning around and grabbing the available match, the toad will say, it's my birthday. Thank you, Mario. I'm so happy. Before spawning a star, which would ultimately crash the game and send you back to your original unharmed save state. But with so many alleged anomalies popping up over the course of these 27 years, you have to start to wonder, was any of this real? Personalization, the golden Mario, the birthday toad. Well, the cold hard truth? Absolutely fucking not. While this theory had picked up enough traction to become the modern meme of every single Iceberg Explained video on YouTube, some viewers could easily discern the reality from the blatant, I, for lack of better term, creepy pasta. But with the amount of traction that it garnered, some, if not a considerable amount of people, genuinely took the personalization of Mario 64 as truth. And honestly, so do I, but probably not in the same way that others do. While I don't believe Nintendo was putting an experimental AI to the test in each of these games, I think Mario 64 had such a vast world to explore and varying ways to explore it. Between the original, the DS version, the remake, your personal playthrough of the game sometime between today and the release date years ago had to be personalized to some degree because the way you move through the game on which specific platform, it's all at your own discretion. But despite the fact that this personalization is false, it's fun. But not only that, it was refreshing to see the game revived in a new way. When you have a masterpiece like this lying essentially dormant without any new content, since I guess like 2004 with the release of the DS game? It led fans to come to the conclusion that if you wanted more Mario 64, well, this time around, you could create it for yourself, contorting the most basic things into driving forces for that content. For example, in an interview with Shigeru Miyamoto, conducted by Bravo TV in 1996, Miyamoto is quoted saying the following. Player, uh, the game itself always changes with players playing. And well, my interpretation of this would mean something more along the lines of the way that you play through the game isn't linear others took this literally therefore taking their own interpretation of what's said and blending it with a false reality but as we'll learn throughout my discoveries here not all theories are created equal while some are simply the works of fan imaginations others like the wario apparition blend both the fun of fan theories with factual findings the wario apparition is a mysterious anomaly that lurks in the depths of super mario 64 an anomaly that theorists have given in what they deem to be a dark and disturbing backstory. This floating head is found in the room beyond the 30-star door in the basement, which leads you to Dire Dire Docks. But after locking onto the player, this disembodied Wario head is said to start rapidly approaching the player, chomping and laughing maniacally. While its appearance and exactly what takes place is determined by the alleged personalization
Russian AI, sometimes appearing in rather shocking and mangled forms as it hauls ass towards you down the hall. Regardless of its appearance, it's actually what happens after meeting the Wario apparition that is the most haunting part of this theory. The player is said to experience what could be classified as stroke-like symptoms and severe memory loss. And while this one, personally, for me, crosses more into the over-the-top funny category rather than being scary to any degree, and I, I kind of think it does for a lot of people to be honest, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything about the Wario apparition is completely false. Dating back to E3 in 1996, Wario's face can actually be seen floating above the second Bowser level entry. This time around, it was actually Charles Martinet, the voice actor known for his portrayal of both Mario and Luigi within the game series since 1992? Let me just fact check that one. Okay, yeah. But not to be confused with Chris Pratt, though, I see how you could easily mix them up. They sound identical. But at this live tech demonstration for the highly anticipated N64, Charles captivated the audience with his portrayal of Wario displayed on an enormous projection screen. And it's this appearance at E3 that decades later birthed what has become one of the most infamous Mario 64 horror stories to ever haunt the game. But with this floating Wario head never actually appearing in the game, you have to wonder where did this come from? And with a little research, we may have found an answer to our question. Mario teaches typing is known to feature what I would call an almost identical floating head. It's been known to appear within promotional booths as early as 1992, when it appeared at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show, and interacted with convention goers in real time, well, obviously being controlled by a human. Not the AI or things could have, you know, gone really bad. Therefore, we can make the presumption that either this Wario model had been altered from Mario and reused for the promotional event, or with Mario Teaches Typing 2 already in development, releasing in 1997 just a year after this Wario appearance, the team could have very well put a fresh spin on a more recent model to act as a quick and easy asset to enthrall the crowd attending this demo. But more importantly than the origins of the floating head is exactly where it appears, the basement of the castle. When taking a look at the Mario 64 iceberg, we can find an entry titled The Internal Plexus of the Castle. Simply put, this entry sort of has a split definition, one that is very much real and one that pushes us deeper into a bizarre territory. At its core, without diving too deep into the fan theory just yet, this entry sort of refers to the fact that the internal architecture of the castle contradicts what we see on the outside. But with the blanket of personalization being involved in just about every aspect of the game now, this would sort of give us the idea that the castle was very much alive, contorting itself to your every move and ultimately making the decision to either share its secrets with you or choose to protect you from what lies beyond the base game. Therefore, this theory is one that just adds more fuel to the fire when it comes to things such as the Wario apparition, meaning that the castle itself could almost be looked at as the main antagonist of the game. And while that's enough fan theory lore to make your head spin, it doesn't end there. It's this plexus theory that some describe as the central hub for the personalization AI, as the code that allegedly makes it up can't be found anywhere within the game's code base. So it's led fans to speculate that the strange arrangement of rooms in the castle is actually a representation of the AI's nervous system. However, the secrets of the castle are nothing new to this game nor to the world of fan theories. One that I've always found interesting is the reported sighting of a Mario silhouette, a completely black figure shaped identical to the player that seems to only appear inside Peach's castle. The silhouette is said to always be on the move, with the abilities to jump into paintings and open star doors as it sees fit. Breaking its stride via a punch or dive is said to drastically alter the game, causing glitches in mass and even crashes to occur. Much like the Wario apparition, this is one that blurs the lines between truth and fan theory. Knowing that cartridge glitches exist, the potential for a shadow Mario is far from impossible. And while obviously there was no passive aggressive silhouette cut into the game's code base, labeling this as untrue is sort of difficult, and I think that's what draws me to this theory more than any other. While I didn't own an N64 until long past its prime, the idea of cartridge tilting is one that I had heard rumors about since first getting unfettered internet access at a young age. In the middle of a game, very carefully wiggling a cartridge from side to side can cause these games to enter an incredibly weird state, as enough information from the cartridge is blocked to enter a glitch like state, but without removing it fully, it's not enough to cause the game to freeze, crash, or error out. But rather, if done in the correct way, can be cause for some seriously disturbing play states. The one that stands out for me is probably the various different faces that Pikachu makes if you tilt the cartridge in Hey You Pikachu. Or maybe for you, it's the Ocarina of Time glitch that allows the player to access the debugger, where a message can be found that just
just reads, I love you. And while those are a couple of the most documented cases of cartridge tilting, with all of this in mind, does seeing a silhouette of Mario really seem that crazy? If you've ever experienced an anomaly or really anything strange in Mario 64, please leave a comment. I'd love to know how much truth the creepy passes are actually based on. But anyways, back to our storyline. Now that we have an understanding of the explosive wave of this kind of fan-made content, it's time to take a look back at some of the legitimate in-game mysteries that influenced almost everything that can be found on that iceberg. However, we'll now be doing so through a bit of a tainted lens, as once you've experienced the many bizarre stories that the fandom has to offer, it's almost hard to see this game in the same way perhaps you once did. But with that being said, I don't think this would be a true Mario 64 video if I didn't at least start the real mysteries off with what I would say is one of the great Nintendo legends. L is real 2401. Back before the internet was present to immediately serve you a viable answer for any question you had, the majority of gaming secrets were found the hard way. For example, if you managed to collect all 120 stars in the game, you could climb on top of the castle and talk to Yoshi who had a little surprise waiting for you. Something that proved to be true for those willing to put in the work and see it for themselves, L is real 2401 is something of a cryptic easter egg that rotted the minds of players for longer than two decades until finally getting an answer. The urban legend is said to be part of a long-standing belief that Luigi could be unlocked as a playable character. Somehow, some way. Although the text on the plaque in the courtyard is barely even distinguishable in my eyes, through years of trial and error and arguments, enough fans of the series decided on two conclusions. This either reads L is real 2401 or Eternal Star. To be honest, I literally see nothing aside from maybe some vague indents in the plaque, but either way. What is written supposedly carries no real significance anyways, as there was once a letter written from Nintendo to a player stating that it was added as a joke by the developers. For the sake of players, over analyzing it. Regardless, this didn't stop fans of the series from trying an unbelievable amount of things in hope of being the first to unlock Luigi. Assuming that the number of 2,401 was actually an objective for players, some speculated that collecting that number of coins would make Luigi appear, or running that number of laps around the courtyard plaque would, I guess, also make Luigi appear. However, all of this effort to prove Luigi was in the game ultimately paid off 24 Four years later, but not in the same way that you might assume. In an interview conducted in 1996, Miyamoto revealed that Nintendo once planned Luigi to appear in the game, but was eventually scrapped in production due to hardware limitations. Something that was proven true when that Giga Leak took place, as buried in the game's code base was that proof of Luigi that everyone had been longing for. And while it was incredibly cool to see one of the great gaming urban legends actually pan out to be true, despite the scribe message being irrelevant, or what? was it? 2401 equals 24 years and one month when the Giga Lake happened. Oh yeah, maybe we solved it. But uh, moving on, sorry. Um, the reveal of Luigi almost felt like 2020 might be the year that we ultimately saw this game start to fade away into the sunset. I mean, that was sort of the last massively popular loose end, at least as far as I had been concerned. But was I ever wrong? The discovery of Luigi in this game's codebase had instead simply taken people's attention away from a long-lived mystery and laser-focused it onto hundreds of other aspects of the game. But instead of the varying in-game mysteries, it seemed like this time around users started to dissect the overall aura of the game. Take the enemies, for example. While it's easy with modern games to become accustomed with the many expressions and body language of approaching enemies, the limitations of the N64's graphical capabilities sort of left a lot of the enemies featured in the game with a much more, like, deadpan look that I think is easy to misinterpret for scary when it was just sort of Nintendo doing their best with the tools they had. I mean, we've seen what these look like in the modern era of Mario games, and as highly detailed enemies, a lot of that edge just disappears. Let's look at the Chain Chomp. Although I've personally grown to find this thing adorable, I can definitely see how its razor-sharp teeth and unpredictable jagged movements make it all the more intimidating, even if that wasn't initially what Nintendo had in mind. But it isn't just this one enemy that stands out. It's a continuing trend that follows throughout the game. The jump scare piano that snaps at you when you're trying to grab that coin, or even the sudden emergence of the eel's face. I definitely understand the uncanny feelings that some people feel towards the enemies, especially if you've taken a long hiatus from the game where it was your first playthrough now in modern days. Maybe it's in retrospective that this becomes 
becomes clear, but the enemies that inhabit these bright and colorful worlds almost feel exhausted. Looking back with the perspective of everything and everyone being stuck in the walls locked behind paintings, what is usually seen as a typical NPC route, it, it somehow gains a feeling of despair knowing that creatures like the Womp are fated to continuously walk their route without a single thought behind those eyes for all eternity. And while I don't necessarily find these scary, Nintendo had to have known that some of the creatures they created felt a little bit lifeless. But then I look at the enemies featured in the beta and, well, let's just say things could have been a lot worse, I guess. But maybe I'm the problem here. Maybe I've fallen too far down this rabbit hole. I mean, I'm starting to empathize with 27 year old N64 models, but can you blame me for it? I've been consuming nothing but Mario 64 content for what is weeks now, and I've started to pick up on another thing. In both previous and modern games, Mario's relationship with death is somewhat of a silly one, usually letting out one of his traditional hoots or hollers with a rather light-hearted expression before expulging a couple coins and vanishing off the screen. Mario Odyssey is a great example for the feelings that I'm trying to convey to you here. Things like walking into a Goomba or even a cactus, they have that sort of goofy cartoon whack sound effect. If we pan back to 64 and take a look at Mario's relationship with his own mortality, there's a level of realism that is featured within each death animation that is sort of unsettling, I'll admit that much. Mario's body filling with visible panic as he knowingly starts to drown, and you're left feeling helpless watching the health bar tick down to nothing. Or worse yet, the audible coughs Mario lets loose, while visibly suffocating when exposed to the toxic gas of the Hazy Maze Cave. The fatalities in Super Mario 64 may be similar to those in Galaxy, at least to me personally, but they carry a different level of impact. Impact. Much like the enemies, I think it's easy to cross up the combination of outdated graphics, limited detail, and the game's age, and quickly label it as scary when the proper term might be something more like harsh or unpolished. And that's something that makes this iceberg so strange in itself. All of the theories are a little unpolished, polarizing even. When doing research for this video, there's some people who get upset over theories but then talk about how much they love others. I think that's what makes it so special. It provides users with something personal personally to latch on to. If you don't like the apparition or you find personalization to be stupid, other theories might ring true for you, like the alleged negative emotional aura of Wet Dry World. And it's with this theory that I want to begin touching on the aesthetic aspect of the environments present in Mario 64, starting here one of the most polarizing levels featured in Mario 64, which upon discovering that this level had negative feelings associated with it, it didn't really come as a surprise to me. I mean, water levels time and time again seem to be the most despised things on the planet. Playing an entire game, becoming accustomed to the physics only to have that suddenly pried out from underneath you, is a common reason people love to hate this style of gameplay. But Wet Dry World doesn't necessarily carry that level of frustration the way that other water levels might. Instead, it's reported that something about this level's design and aesthetic give it a rather unnerving and uncomfortable aura. A level that draws up hundreds of questions and ultimately provides you with zero answers. The way the level is designed feels like it was intentional to leave the user feeling trapped. While I don't experience a sense of dread per se, this level does invoke a little feeling of panic, as not only am I incredibly claustrophobic, I'm also just terrified of water, and I mean at its core the level is just a rising swimming pool with cement walls on the sides, and looking up doesn't make things much better. The sort of oversaturated rippling sky, complemented by a strange collage of towering buildings, all aligned side by side. The realism of this image had been traced back to Shabam, a town in Yemen with a population of around 7,000 people. Why Nintendo chose to take the buildings and create this is ultimately something I can't explain, but if anyone has rhyme or reason, I'd love to hear it in the comments. The overall look and feel of this level is something to be considered. While most in the game follow what could be considered a design guide, take bob -omb Battlefield for example. The setting of this course takes place on and around a mountain, with players starting at the bottom and ultimately following the route to the peak to duke it out with the big bob -omb. This level sort of lays out a clear path for the user to follow, with textures and 
enemies that you would associate with that said mountain and end level boss. Whereas Wet Dry World seems to be an obscure mixture of everything that had been left over, almost leaving the player with a sense of disconnect to the world that they're traversing. I think the best way that I could describe this would be those pieces of AI art that you see. I mean, even the skybox itself looks like it was generated by one of those things. Like it's close to what a city looks like, I guess. But paired with this surreal skyline, something feels so off. However, the strangest thing to come from this stage has to be the area that lies beyond the long water tunnel. The second half of the stage, although this time looking a little more put together, it's still suspiciously empty with nothing more than a few skeeters kicking around. Leading us to the question, are we wandering through an abandoned district of the city? Or is something much more sinister to blame for the isolation? Had the rising and falling of water left this place uninhabitable? What happened here? Everything about this place forces you to start questioning the rest of your surroundings, with the most glaring problem being traced back to the Castle Plexus ideology. While some described a negative aura from Wet Dry World, for me personally, I always found the emptiness of the castle to be the most troubling part of the game. But upon looking into this, in multiple comment sections both on YouTube and Reddit, I had found a rumor that was being stated as fact. Allegedly, this stems from a user sending an email to Nintendo regarding the emptiness of the castle. Nintendo of Europe is said to have answered all of these questions featured in the email. And this user was given the explanation that Peach is so rich, she's able to own two castles, one for her furniture and another for her artwork. And while it took me some time, I was actually able to track this down to its source. For all of these years, what was a conversation on Tumblr had somehow evolved into canon lore. I was able to get in contact with Eleanor, the person behind the Tumblr account because good heroes deserve kidneys. And she kindly gave me an explanation as to how this all happened, stating that this email was written when her husband was about 15 years old on a now abandoned Hotmail account. Seeing as these two are now in their mid to late 30s, this would put that email at roughly 20 years old, which in turn with the passage of time has left this email as nothing more than lost media. And while I don't believe they have anything to gain from making this up, not to mention it wouldn't be the first time someone had written Nintendo regarding a Mario 64 mystery and received a concrete answer, but without the email to actually back this up, it's hard to say whether it's canon or not. Not. But for the sake of my next subject, let's move forward with the idea that it is true. I mean, it would at least give a little bit of reasoning to the overall aesthetic or therefore lack of that is felt in and around the castle. I mean, even the opening cinematic, for example, it sets the tone that I had always personally felt from the start. Princess Peach and her handwritten note appearing in the sky before both disappearing into the distance. This moment, along with the events that follow, create a surreal and almost dreamlike atmosphere. As you approach the castle, doors, you're greeted by Lakitu and his camera, explaining that he'll be following you around and documenting every moment of your journey from behind the lens. You have to imagine that some parts of this alleged live broadcast help in reinforcing that unpronounced feeling of being watched that some users have reported. As throughout the game, no matter where you go, Lakitu is always there with you, mirroring your every move and never letting up for a second. Upon taking your first steps into the castle, the first thing you'll notice is a quiet emptiness. Every sound made and every step you take can cast an echo from wall to wall. This hollowed out feeling contrasting against the bright wallpaper, an almost funhouse like environment, almost leaves you with a sense of cynicism towards your surrounding. Nothing is ever quite as it seems. The haunting cackle of Bowser echoes, the trap doors, the illusions and secret passages, all of this adds to the overall ambience. The endless staircase probably being the most well known of all of these, and while it's not really a secret or a mystery in itself, it was something that felt otherworldly when I first played the game. This and of course the perspective manipulation that leaves you feeling like an ant as you make your way down the hall to dive into that picture. Despite being provided with a temporary escape to different worlds, as quickly as you dive into any of these paintings, you'll inevitably find yourself back between the castle walls. And as you venture from world to world, there is a feeling of isolation that never really goes away. But is it really as negative as everyone portrays it to be? I love the game as it was, don't get me wrong, but I think a part of me always wanted an extra character to appear for Mario's sake. As a child, my first playthrough of this game was not on the N64, but rather my clunky old red DS that I got for Christmas, albeit it's a, it's a much different game that for some reason hasn't gone on to carry that same love that the N64 version has. Despite being so much fun, my first playthrough of this game doesn't carry that same feeling of vague isolation, and maybe that's because you know you're not alone. 
But that doesn't mean that this game breaks from the mysterious theme at all, as one character still remains missing. And with Waluigi out of the picture, this led to a plethora of theories being developed about his existence. Look at the switching room, for example, containing four doors, each marked above with the corresponding character's name, except for one. One door remains unmarked, with a stark white border that stands out among the other colored borders, leaving players to only guess that at some point, through trial and error, this would have to become Waluigi's room. But in reality, this white bordered door just ended up containing a secret power star. But users didn't just find this out until they had already gone through the trouble of collecting 50 power stars and 8 glowing rabbits, which leads to the game's next mystery. Why is there a beta screenshot that features a purple rabbit? that was cut from the final game. Although it's not entirely certain what this rabbit would have actually done for us, the color has to count for something right? Some believe it would have simply unlocked mini games, while others speculate it held the key to unlocking Waluigi as a playable character, which in my opinion would make the most sense as to why it was scrapped if that's the case. Because if not, the in-game color scheme is intentionally adding fuel to this fire, with red, yellow, green, and purple menu buttons, and even purple dots on the recreation room floor. These little inconsistencies start to add up. Take a look at this image of Peach's castle on the file select screen. On the right hand side of the castle, there's a new and strange dark gray box that doesn't appear in the game. And though it's been dismissed as a texture glitch, that's sort of hard to back up because this box is also present in an early build of the game that was showcased at E3 2004. The main guess is that this could have held a cannon that would shoot, well, you out of it. Which makes sense considering in that same E3 footage, you can see what looks like a floating island that would be in the perfect trajectory for a safe landing. But regardless of your interpretation, the black box isn't even really what I wanted to focus on here. The file select screen pre-render is completely janked. The middle tower, it's shorter and stubbier than the one that we've become accustomed to. The skybox is based on the original game shifting Sandland. The truth behind the mysterious castle plexus theory on the iceberg is not because of some advanced AI, but rather a testament to the power of perception and how it can manipulate everything that we believe. You see, yes, some aspects of the castle raise the question of architectural integrity. Nothing quite adds up. The lack of internal windows not aligning with the exterior windows? Alternate areas appearing between games? But at this point, the villain in this tale is no longer a recognizable in-game character, but rather our own imagination bending to conform with the internet's incredible overanalyzation of every pin drop featured in this game. Every element being filtered through millions of different perspectives over the course of the last almost three decades. It's the over-examination of Mario 64 that has slowly led it to become a horror game, something I started finding myself doing countless times. And it was then that I began finding aspects that genuinely sparked fear in me. Mario 64 created a unique and unforgettable atmosphere, shaping users' playthroughs with small but effective plays on sensory elements. The environment, the musical scores, the mysteries, the madness of it all. It was strategic put together to create an experience of wonder and enchantment, something that I think is easy to get crossed up with other emotions. That's not to invalidate people's feelings in any way. Horror is subjective and I can't lie. The game does evoke something in me that's hard to express, and I'm not trying to take that away from anyone, but does that mean that I believe Super Mario 64 is truly a frightening experience? No, but there are aspects to the game that of course are eerie to say the least, but the idea of Mario 64 being a horror game? More so than being factual is fun and I love everything about it. This game has captivated fans for 27 years and counting, and it somehow just keeps getting better. From ROM hacks to fan projects to creepy pastas, it's something I love so deeply about the internet and fandoms in general. The fact that you can just imagine something, regardless of how silly or stupid it may be, and have it examined and processed through the filters of millions. Making this video and getting the chance to dive into content created by the fandom has made it one of my favorite projects to work on. It's incredible how a game can die and be resurrected, reinvented time and time again. So with that, thanks for watching friends. Until next time.